Hello and welcome to this episode of Digging Deeper. My name is Jean and I've actually got Robert with me. Hey guys. And we're going to be talking with Brandon through this Hello. week's message. All right. Um, first I'm gonna, time we've had three people. This is the first time. First time. Yeah, we had Trifecta. to experiment with some camera angles and stuff okay. to figure out how to make it work. Everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But um, here's here's the reasoning behind it. Okay. One, why not? Right? People say, why do you have three people? Well, yeah, more the merrier. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Two, um, I had actually asked a couple staff members. I said, hey, do you want to do this episode of Digging Deeper about the shrewd manager? And I got some pretty solid no <laughs> awesome i don't awesome and i was like okay well i i don't mind doing it um but i don't Based know upon I... just elimination people can figure out which staff member right. said no <laughs> yeah, right yeah, now, I know. there's <laughs> only three of us here there. right okay just so ben said no that. and pete said no nailed it <laughs> Maybe and Mariah. then i thought about doing anthony and then i was like man that'd be a rough a rough start yeah that'd be a rough introduction to him so here we are. Not that it's the B team by any means. It's just let's switch it up. Let's change all it right, up. All right. Let's go. Cool. You know, let's and go. all three of us, you know, me and Robert Co did the announcements yesterday. You did the message. So yeah. some familiarity, right? Here we go. Yep. All right. So you spoke on the shrewd manager. Yep. Luke 16. Yes. Um, shrewd is an interesting word. It's interesting that it's not very like a... Uh, we don't use it all the time, but let some translations really have clung to it. Um, I've always seen shrewd as like aggressive or I've always imagined yeah. shrewd as like in my mind, like the in high school we did, we read a Shakespeare play taming of the shrew. And that's kind of like a abrasive person. Yeah. And so shrew and shrewd putting them together. I think my mind just always thought of that. So hearing that shrewd is wisdom and it's the person who built their house upon the rock, same yeah. kind of root word. That was kind of a interesting reframing of my mind for that. Um, what in your studying, in your going through it, um, what did you find to be the most like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't see it that way of this specific story of the shrewd and the dishonest manager. Well, I think just like you mentioned, the word shrewd itself for me carries a very almost argumentative and negative connotation. Mm -hmm. And so to see in verse eight that it talks about that he was commended for his shrewdness, it's like, well, how can you commend someone who's argumentative and negative? Um, similar at the men's retreat, uh, I talked about one of the talks I gave was the prudent man. Mm -hmm. And I feel like prudent and shrewd, which actually have some of the same roots, um, both those words in today's culture, just, they just, I don't know, like, prude or prudent yeah, just yeah. seems like uh, like yeah like it's like shrewd. old school yeah, yeah prudent shrewd <laughs> yeah. um so i think what's first stuck out to me was yeah the the idea that the master commended this guy for acting shrewdly and i was like well if he's commended then it can't be some argument of negative nature right. at least that doesn't seem representative of the rest of the scripture so what's going on here mm -hmm. and so that really caused me to dig even more um because that that verse in itself is probably the most problematic by yeah. far. Yeah. Um, there's in this in this uh, parable, you kind of broke it down through the message, um, through your message. And one of the things you said was the manager is a representation um, of the master to the debtors. So you have the master; he's got all this money or funds or whatever, uh, olive oil, yeah. and then you have the manager who is managing the funds, kind of the intermediary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have the debtors, or the people who need to pay mm -hmm. him back. And how to the debtors, um, the manager is the face of the master. Yeah. Um, I couldn't help but draw absolute parallels to that is Christians. Or it should be. That yeah. should be us. Like yeah. we are the face of God, Jesus, um, to a world that doesn't know him. Ambassadors. Ambassadors. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's, it's biblical. It's all over the place. Um, so how would you say or how could we... How are we doing being that visual representation of God or Christ to our culture, to our city, to our nation? And how could we improve to both of you guys? Are you talking about in general? Or are we talking in the vein of the series financials? Um, let's go both. I, I okay. was thinking general. Okay. Personally or as a church? <laughs> We're just trying to get Sorry, clarity. Personal. Personal. <laughs> personal. Personal. Okay. How do you yeah. feel Christians are doing i thought you just want me to answer how i think robert's doing oh yeah yeah that's <laughs> that yeah that's great that. no. <laughs> how about you start not just individual but as christians how are we doing as christians as christians in america i think that there's a few layers to this i think that our witness um sometimes leaves some to be desired right sometimes we can become 
almost like syncretized with culture. There's a pressure from culture that's so strong these days that there's this like, if you, if you don't conform with us, if you don't become just as tolerant, if you don't become just as accepting of what we consider to be true or not true, if you don't even start to embrace things like relativity um, and all those different things that are being pushed by our culture, there can be a real temptation, I think, right now to be really like syncretized with our um, with our culture. And so from there, that kind of breaks down sometimes the witness or the representation, the ambassadorship that we have. Um, on, on the other hand, I, I mean, I, Christians are leading some of the most like good things that's happening, whether it's pregnancy care clinics. So you, you kind of mentioned a bunch of different examples yeah. of how this happens. I think that we could talk about organizations both here and abroad in different countries, but we could also talk about just stuff that we see in our church and then the people around us. And you see a lot of good in that too. So it's hard to, to paint with a broad stroke when when it's when we're trying to evaluate, are we being a good witness? Are we being a good represent, representative? Or are we being a bad representative? Um, and so, I, I mean, I know that's... that's yeah, I'm th- I think you know. what you said is important. I think it's really hard to... And we're talking about, what is it, six, seven billion people now on the planet. And yeah. much of the news stuff that I get is just... 350 million people in the United States. So it's hard to like say how it's doing overall. Yeah. Um, I would agree with Robert that I feel like in our country, the representation that we're giving is not giving people an accurate or an authentic view of who God is. Um, one of the things I was reading this morning that just it catches my attention is like right now there's this kind of debate in politics, like how much should your faith actually impact your political views? And there is a large amount of senators and Congress people now that are saying it shouldn't. Like I can separate my faith from my political viewpoints. Scripturally, I just I I can't find that. <laughs> you know, where if you go to other parts of the world, um, they are fully engaged and sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if it costs them their careers or maybe their very lives. And so in some areas, I think there's good and authentic and accurate representation. I think here there's there's examples of that, absolutely. But I think that um, I think that there's a better way that we could go about uh, representing the master in our culture than we do currently. That's mm-hmm. good. Tim Keller he talks about he defines evangelism as entering into culture in order to challenge culture with the gospel, and he talks about how if we just enter into culture then we become just like culture, right? Syncretism. We become just involved and and just conforming to what the culture is. On the other hand, if we just challenge with the gospel, we become legalists. We become really legalistic. And so really finding kind of that sweet spot in the middle of of we're entering into the culture and we're willing to be challenging it to yeah. confront yeah. with the gospel. Yeah, it's culture. like grace and truth paradox. Yeah. Yeah, you need, need both. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, how are Christians doing financially? In that same question, I mean, I would answer the, the very similar, um, very similar to culture to well to what the previous in general. Like okay, I yeah. think, I think in the Western world, I would have one answer, and I think uh, on the global scale, I'd have a different answer. Um, don't get me wrong; I think that there are tons of people that have done well um, in managing their finances in a God honoring way in kind of the American culture. But I also think that. I mean, all of us, I mentioned this two weeks ago, it's the fishbowl. Like our fishbowl that we live in is consumption, accumulation, mm-hmm. greed. And when Jesus yeah. says, be, a, be aware for the various types of greed, I mean, it's just, it's the air that we breathe here. Mm-hmm. And, and so, um, I mean, traveling in, in different countries and, and doing different mission trips, stuff like that, the level of gratitude and appreciation for far less compared to the lack of gratitude and appreciation that we have for far more. <laughs> Uh, quickly shows the disparity yeah. and and shows where our hearts, I think, are um, not fully having Jesus sit on the throne. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I think two weeks ago, I shared this statistic, like two and a half percent. I mean, and these this this is one of those, like, you know, sometimes be like, oh, statistics just kind of made up or whatever. You know, like, what, what is it? People joking like, oh, 72% of all statistics are <laughs> made <laughs> spot. Yeah. But, but like, Faith-based and non-faith-based organizations have can look at people's charitable giving, mm-hmm. whether it be to organizations, whether it be nonprofits, churches, things like that. Two and a half percent of Christians who identify as Christian, whether they be Catholic, evangelical, whatever, two and a half percent is how many people actually like give um, 
uh, no, excuse me, that's the average amount of what they give mm-hmm. on an annual basis, two and a half percent of their income. And then non-believers, those who do not identify, whether agnostic or neither, none, whatever, are at 2% of their income. Mm-hmm. So even if you just looked at everybody in the United States and said, on average, people give 2.5% of their income when we're the most wealthy planet or wealthy country on the planet, I think we're missing the mark. <laughs> and yeah. then that greed is the fishbowl that we live in. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I, I think well said. The uh, fishbowl, on a total tangent, but the fishbowl, I've, uh, so there's been a book that's been being read in circles that I am close with, um, Letters of the Church by Francis Chen. Multiple people have been reading it. And so I'm like, I need to know what's going on. Like, I need, I want to know where they're coming from. Um, and so reading that book, it it's really interesting because it's like, it challenges things that I have just come to know as church. Mm-hmm. Um and so it's been really good because it's caused me to reevaluate. And so the fishbowl thing, it's so real. And you have no clue about it until you yeah. step outside. Like you honestly have no clue what you don't know. You don't yeah. know what you don't know yeah. until you're removed yeah. from it. I think that's why it's so important to, like we as a church want to continue to advocate traveling and going different places and and being involved in different cultures. and Such as the Mexico mission trip. Mexico mission trip or, mission yeah. trip or other endeavors like yeah. that. I mean, my paradigm was completely shaped in a new way when I first worked uh, outside of Cape Town, South Africa in a uh, kind of an apartheid shanty area um, with uh, kids that had HIV. And, and then living in Morocco for three weeks teaching English. I mean, some of these different cultures and to see and to live amongst the people uh, it shifts everything. Be like, whoa. I mean, in some ways, it's like, I mean, I'm from Illinois, moving to California, and so many Californians have never, like, left California. <laughs> and you're like... Why would you? Yeah, well, I guess I guess that's okay. <laughs> I mean, of, but, I'm, but I'm just saying, like, so you, you start talking to people about the way things are where you're from, and they're like, no, no way. I'm like, you realize that California is the weird state compared to everybody <laughs> else. And they're like, no, that's the fishbowl. They don't know any yeah. differently, so... Right. But it's also got diversity, right? Um, like even in San Diego, there's so much diversity between East County and Encinitas, right? Sure. Or even, you know, City Heights and there, there's so much diversity all over. I mean, even within El Cajon and Lake, like even in East County, there's yeah. a huge difference like El Cajon Lakeside or whatever. So there's some measure of exposure that can happen. Oh yeah. you. I think borders. you can actually yeah. get more multicultural exposure here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm just saying just the way people operate, think perhaps steward or lack of steward, their resources is, is of one mentality in this place compared to other places. And particularly that's true, not just in the U S but when you compare it to the rest of the world. I feel like in, in the westernized world, U.S., European countries, all over, there seems to be this pressure to keep up with everyone else. And so you're always looking at the latest and greatest. I mean, if you have an iPhone 4, like, what are you doing? Right? No like, one has an iPhone 4. That is like seven, eight versions behind. You can't even run the newest operating system on a 4. <laughs> I don't know. But it's like, <laughs> there's so much pressure to always find the latest and greatest. Sure. And I don't know if that exists in other places of the world all the time. Maybe to some extent. I mean, and there's, def- there's definitely places that there's still that rat race. But when you look at the majority of the world, mm-hmm. they are not trying to figure out a standard of living. They're trying to figure out how to just live. Yeah. And that's a, like the whole conversation of standard of living is very unique to prosperous Western yes. world. Yes. Um, when everybody else is like, well, that'd be nice. Like, consider right, what, what version of the iPhone you have. Exactly um, right. I'm just trying to figure out how to get food in my belly today. Uh-huh. So, yeah. yeah. You had another point. Um, money and possessions are a tool given to us for ministry. Yeah. Um, I have two things I want to talk about from that. The first one um, is a story I heard once. Um, and it's not actually, there's not really a question related. I'm just going to tell you, about you, say that. Gonna tell like, you a story. Yeah, I want to hear no, a story. No, it's a story. <laughs> um, story time. Here we go, and John. It was about, it was during like the time of like serfs and you had land with servants and stuff like that, probably middle ages. And, um, he was a wealthy person. He had a lot of servants. He was a Christian, loved God, treated them well, reading through the Bible or going to church or something, whatever it was back then. He comes across the story of the rich young ruler and how he should sell everything to follow Jesus. Hmm. And this man goes, okay, that's what I need to do. I need to sell everything to follow Jesus. So he sells everything. Um, Just qu- is this a true story or like a it's modern It's a story parable? I've heard in a message. 
So I would love to tell you it's like true. Like you your haircut by the the barber shop. No, no, no. Like a story or no, no. Like uh, I, a pastor <laughs> said it. Okay. So, okay. so I, unfortunately, oh, I can't tell you. Yeah, so, oh, I can't so it's tell about eighty percent to be true. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Unless it's me. Unless it's hundred percent true. No, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I do believe it's true, but okay. I don't know the story. Okay. I heard it through someone else. Fair enough. Um, he sells everything. The person who ends up buying his land is a cruel man. Um, beats the servants, treats them poorly, and they come up to him and they go, "Hey, like." we need your help. Like, please. Like this guy is mean. He's aggressive. He hurts us. And the guy was like, I cannot do anything. I'm so sorry. Like I've given everything up. I can't help you at all. And so it's this kind of flip of, we're kind of told that the Christian, the the one who's following Jesus is poor and they don't have anything. Um, and that's how they follow God. But in the story, we realized that this guy was able to serve the people and serve God by treating these people well. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of fits right in with this money and possessions are a tool given to us for ministry. Like because of the elevation or the elevated status, the status that this guy had, he was able to be a light to this group of people. Hmm. Um, that's a story. Now a question. Okay. You said specifically about desert tool toys. <laughs> okay. Desert toys. That's, yeah. a, desert that's definitely toys. an East County yeah. reference um, here. Which 100%, like if you have dirt, dirt bikes or like quads or something, just let us know. Yeah. Um, Robert at riceteachers.com. Yeah. John yeah. at riceteachers.com. <laughs> um, but um, that goes to show, you said invite someone to the desert with mm -hmm. you for the weekend. If you invite someone to the desert with you for the weekend and your idea of a good time is nothing different than a worldly idea of a good time. Um, is that a light at all? Is that really being a representation of Jesus or the gospel? Or where is the need to say, hey, my lifestyle reflects that of Christ, and in so doing that, I'm generous towards you? Hmm. Well, I, th I think that I would say that what I don't want to be misinterpreted as saying is like, you should invite someone out to the desert with your desert toys, and before the weekend's over, you need to share the entire gospel with them and give them a salvation presentation. Right. I, that For it sure. was to gain friends, yeah. so that when these things are gone, they might welcome you into eternal dwellings. What it says, it is creating opportunities to forge friendships that cultivate communication, that eventually, upon God's great timing, um, the right time, that you will be able to hopefully share the hope that you have. Absolutely. And I believe as a follower of Jesus, if you hang out with me for the weekend, I would hope that by the way I treat you, the words that I use, the experience that you have, that that you feel loved and valued and dignified and that the generosity that I extend to you um, somehow makes you feel important, which, which I think is Christ honor. I think that's how God works. And so... So my encouragement is more of like looking at all the things that you have and saying, if you have them and you enjoy them, which and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. There's a lot of things that I possess, you possess that I enjoy, um, whether that be desert toys or tennis shoes, mm -hmm. right? Um, but think about then there's probably others that would too. And when you're willing to be open-handed in those things and share those things, that is countercultural. Mm -hmm. But it's also showing that it's not something that's, as I mentioned yesterday, having kind of the claws in your heart because you're like, I'm openly willing to share them or even let go of them so someone else would benefit from them. And that, to me, one, says it's not an idol, that it's not something that is taking great, greater residence on the throne than Jesus. Um, and I'm also looking at it and say, of course I have, we've talked about this on the, the podcast before, like, of course I have an agenda. Mm -hmm. Like, yes. I absolutely have an agenda um, and it's not to dismiss you becoming my friend because I love you, but if I become friends with you and I love you, then the thing that I have to offer that's the greatest to you is what I believe is Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, and I don't have a problem being up front with that. I mean, I, I've coached baseball teams and I am really quick to tell people like, oh, I'm so excited, you know, I'm a pastor for church and I just really can't wait to hang out with you guys. I want you to know up front, like, an invitation's coming at some point in this mm -hmm. season from me. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I just think it's leverage more than it is um, than trying to like in that instant moment make this the moment to share the gospel. But you're leveraging right. it for potentially a moment in the future. Yeah, I think I would um, 
like I think that the the first my questions were related in the sense of we're a representation of the master mm-hmm. um, in the way that we live our life. Yeah. Um. And so my uh, I guess point in this is like if you're inviting someone to the desert, which you should, and and there's no like compartmentalization with God where it's like, well, this is secular and this is sacred. You know, this is what, um, this is church stuff and this is life stuff. And you don't need to worry about mixing them. Like they're all together. Like God can use a quad for the glory of God, you know, like to to bring glory to himself. Um, But at the same time, if like, you're like, Hey, like me and my couple, me and my family, we're going to go to the desert, you know, da, da, da. And then it's like, you're just like, whatever like living it up in any way you can imagine like whatever debauchery <laughs> sinful lifestyle <laughs> whatever de- i'm trying did, to be how a- did debauchery and desert toys get <laughs> mixed up all of a I sudden know. Yeah. I, well, so i will <laughs> say this title. Uh, <laughs> debauchery and desert toys um i've gone to the desert and you know it's an east county thing i grew up here um and the desert isn't kind of an excuse to get away get a bonfire going have a whole bunch of drinks and craziness because you're arnold palmer's n- yeah right right <laughs> Um, and because you're away from civilization, so there's no yeah. like ramification. And so if you're like, you know, gossiping about people at work and you're doing da, 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 da. And these people are like, Oh, these are, these are like Christians. Like, aren't they a light to the world? Aren't yeah. there? There's something different. Like, so I just feel like that. I don't know. There's like that part of me that I'm like, like we have, like we have, we are the representation of the master. Yeah, absolutely. I think you used a good word that I think relates to all this compartmentalization. Yeah. And I think that if, if we think about compartmentalizing, it's a hard word to say sometimes, but if we think about like trying to like find boxes around like w- the way that we give, the way that we live, when we invite people, the way that we invite people, the way that we um, act in certain scenarios in the desert or wherever, then of course all those issues are going to come up. And also, of course, you're going to give the bare minimum because you're going to p- compartmentalize how much of your life that you're willing to invest in relationships that would lead towards the kingdom of God. Like you've allocated, expanding. you've allocated 5% of your life to God. You know, or so yeah, yeah. So, you know, but you know, I think a better way of looking at that is contextualization of looking at like your desert toys and, and your lifestyle and the relig- relationships that you have as how do I contextualize everything that I have and everything that I am, all my money and possessions to be a tool, like you said, and not just a toy that I play with. Yeah. And I think, I just think that there is this, Christian culture stigma against wealth mm-hmm. and that everybody should like people rail against the prosperity gospel, but there's also a poverty gospel too. Totally. Mm-hmm. And I, and I'm not a proponent of the prosperity gospel, but I'm also, I wouldn't say that all Christians are supposed to live impoverished. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so people that have nice house or desert toys or any of these types of things, like I don't, I don't think there's a problem with that. I mean, some of the wealthiest people in the scriptures were people that were anointed by God. Now, I think you can take that to say, if I love God, then I'm going to become wealthy. That's the prosperity gospel. That's that's an issue. Yeah. I'm pretty sure King David and King Solomon and some of these others, they would have had a lot of desert toys. Mm-hmm. But, it, but it was a matter of like, as a man after God's heart, is what did he do with what he had? And how did he use it for the sake of yeah. blessing others? And it's okay too that if you yourself are blessed in the midst of that, that our Father knows how to give good gifts. Right, mm-hmm. and I think that like we 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 have to be careful not to um, to demonize wealth. It's not, and I mentioned this in one of the services. The scriptures say it's not it's not money that's evil. It's not wealth that's evil. It's yeah. the love of it yeah. when it rules you and you're consumed by it and is for you. Yeah. Um, so so I just also for those listening, I just want to be careful because sometimes what can happen is people get a massive guilt trip because because they have a lot of stuff, and it's like man, you're forced to have a lot of stuff. How can you better use that yeah. stuff that you have in, in, a, in a God-honoring way? Intentional. Yeah. You know, do you have desert toys or do desert toys have you? Yeah. You know, like what's what's owning you mm-hmm. um, and what do you own? And if you just own these things and you're willing to be open-handed with them and be intentional with them, then God can use that. I mean, even in your story talking about sometimes stewardship doesn't have to look like sacrificing it all by giving it all away. Mm-hmm. Sometimes stewardship is by being intentional with what God is placing in your and hand. And desert toys are no different than someone's sneakers. That's right. Right? Yeah. Maybe income levels is what, I can afford desert toys, but at this yeah. income level, I get sneakers. But you can be just as attached yeah. and owned by those items, no matter what your economic mm-hmm. level is. Yeah. And uh, I do know it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Desert toys is just a, uh, it's like a, 
a thing, right? It's not, we're not literally going against desert toys. Desert toys is a representation <laughs> of whatever you choose I, to have I a good time. I use this as an example yes. and joked around yeah. about it because of the cultural yeah. context yes. here in East County. People use that. So and yes. Pods are fun. Yes. You know? and, They're yeah. awesome. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Like invite me. Yeah. I love it. It was yeah. a blast. <laughs> okay. So I have one more question okay. um, and it, you brought it up. David having a heart after God. Yeah. Um, and then one of your points was that God looks at the heart and that motivation matters. So with that, someone, they want to follow God. They want to be generous. They feel, you know, okay, I should be giving to the church. So it comes out of this, like to honor God, to follow God, I should give my finances or whatever, but there's like this hesitation and there's this pull and then I hear this other verse in my head where God loves a generous giver, <laughs> you know? So it's like, how does that person who they want to be faithful to following God and they're like, okay, what I need to do is I need to give and it's going to hurt and I'm not going to like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then you have someone who says, well, if you're not a generous giver, then just don't do it anyway. Like, how do you um, live in that pull of the, those two different kind of concepts? Can I've I, been to I've been to churches where they say, "All right, we're going to do the offering," and the church is expected to like cheer, cheer. and mm-hmm. everyone's like cheering, and they're going down the aisle, and there's upbeat music because it's supposed to be this like yeah. God wants a generous giver, yeah, or a yeah, whatever, happy giver. Yeah, I mean, I I would I would be willing to bet that personality plays a lot into people's reaction to that. Some people just have a greater propensity to be um, pretty shrewd, right? And shrewd in the sense of like just their wisdom is like how strategic or calculated or what exactly is the amount that I should. And is this, and they can become very analytical, maybe even over analytical is like, is this actually the best use or can I do this and do that? Where other people, you know, you get a seven on the Enneagram, who's the party animal. They're like, woo, let's just do it all. I mean, like there are, Dave Ramsey talks about that. They're like free spirits and nerds. Yeah. My guess is a nerd might want to give, but the reaction, the emotional way that they're going to respond to giving is going to be different than the free spirit who thinks it's a party. Mm -hmm. So um, I I don't necessarily think that it's one reaction over another. uh, And I don't think the person who feels a little bit hesitant should feel guilty about that. I think at the end of the day, obedience is what wins out. And if the obedience carries itself out with some hesitation versus the one who has the party or the party over the hesitation, obedience is what matters no matter what. That's so interesting that you went with personality because in my head, I was about to say perspective, but I'm, that Enneagram seven, I think so. <laughs> um, so I probably have a blind spot with that, but I was thinking like, you know, if you have the perspective of like, I'm getting to be part of what God is doing on earth, yeah. I get to be his kingdom come on earth as yeah. it is in heaven, man, what an exciting moment. I, I will give it all. Like, I, yeah. like I can't give enough and, and, and I need to go home and try to figure out, you know, like <laughs> how can I use this and this and this and this to build re- relationships with people so yeah. that I can lead them to Jesus. And so that they can have a life more abundant and I get excited about that. But maybe that is a blind spot. Maybe that is more my personality. I I I would say it's personality, Robert. That makes sense. I could I, be, I mean, and honestly, one of the things that's helped me most in this is is my relationship with Pete. Pete's a generous man, but but Pete is very calculated, and he thinks through everything, and he's not going to have an emotional reaction to very much at all. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't make him not generous. Yeah. Right. I'm a little bit more emotive and demonstrative, and so. I'm going to talk about giving and give with like a more like enthusiastic, like, ah, oh, let's do this. Yeah. But n- it doesn't make one of us more generous than the other. It's just, it's the personality difference. And, and I think that that's so important for people to hear that because you can quickly fall into guilt and shame yeah. because well, maybe I don't, maybe I, maybe money is an idol or maybe I don't love God as much as I want because I'm not near as excited as Robert when it comes to changing the world. Mm-hmm. I think Robert's personality should challenge you it should challenge me, mm-hmm. right? And I think there's something about Pete's personality challenging Robert, yeah. Yeah. you know? Um, because some people can be really stupid in giving. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, they really can. Like, yeah. they haven't thought about anything, and they just like, whoa, it's gone. And all of a sudden, I'm like, yeah, my kids haven't eaten in a week, but, you know, uh, <laughs> you're like, well, yeah. there's, there's some type of, like, uh, I don't know, balance or, right. or trying to figure that out. So, And I would say maybe the balance that you're talking about, as you're, as you're talking, I'm thinking through this, the balance between that personality and perspective might also be the preparation. That's a lot of peace, but, 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 but seriously, Pastor. the way that you kind of go through <laughs> and like, I think it's your time with the Lord, how you're letting the Lord speak into your life and prepare your heart towards things. It'll change sometimes actually every time your perspective and, and it'll filter through your personality. Yeah. And so, so you can be generous and not be exuberant 
um, because you don't, it's filtered through your personality or you can be generous and be prepared and not be foolish while you're enthusiastic yeah. towards it. Well, I mean, God loves a cheerful giver. That's what you're talking yeah. about. Yes. That's well, I think it's Paul, right? how people dis- demonstrate cheerfulness varies based yeah. upon demeanor and personality. Yeah. Like there are people that are like, oh, that's cheerful. And they're like, yeah, like I'm like really cheerful right now. And it's like, it doesn't look near as cheerful as somebody else. But mm-hmm. like, like you just, you have to be careful. Like we have a certain, it's kind of like shrewd and prudent. We have a certain connotation with the words. So we hear God loves a cheerful giver and our mind for some reason runs to party animal and yeah. woohoo and clap and music. Yeah. Well, our mind didn't run there with shrewd and prudent as far as that being wise and intelligent because yeah. it was shaped by a cultural, you know, um, definition or example. So I, I just think some of those verses every once in a while we have to take an even a further step back and say, okay, what picture am I having and could this actually, could that just be one of the pictures, but not the only picture? Right. In response to that, like, shrewd. <laughs> I, well, I want to dig in on this more. We're digging deeper. Yeah, okay. All. But so the word shrewd, you kind of said it has a certain like connotation that comes along with it. But even in that same parable, this guy is also called the dishonest manager. So there's mm-hmm. even like in the parable itself, yeah. there's some words that kind of build Absolutely. up that connotation. You're right. You're right. So how does that play into it? Well, I mean, if they listen to the sermon, I explained yes, okay. I explained what at least my perspective is as far as he was dishonest prior versus, okay. I mean, after he was commended. So, but they can go and listen to that. Yeah, yeah. transformation. Yeah, that's a good point. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Well, I don't know. I think that that was a good conversation. So, we had nothing so you're telling me Ben and Pete and other staff members were I'm scared not, of that I'm conversation? I'm not calling anyone out. Ben's right here behind the camera. I'm well, not come on, calling ben. anyone out. I'm just saying... <laughs> Yeah, I think I do think that part of it is you did a really good job of explaining the message, and they're like, I don't know how to, like, I don't know how to dig deep into this. You kind of explained it all, so that was that was one side of the. Mm-hmm. Oh, so it was refusal. like a compliment. That was yeah, not- yeah, yeah. That was one side of the oh, refusal. Ben, I love you, and Pete, wherever you're at. Okay, honestly, <laughs> if you're listening to this, if you did not listen to the message this last Sunday, I told I told Brandon this already. Literally, while he was still on stage, I went up and told him, I said, I think that might have been the best message I've ever heard on money and resources, um, ever. So, I would encourage you, go listen to it, really think through it, and see what God has to say to you, because God really encouraged me through that. So, Thanks, man. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate that. So, we hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, we will catch you next week. Uh, We're talking about... Week three, cryptocurrency, Mm -hmm. and uh, this week's talking about... Tithing and debt. Right. Yeah, so fun Sunday. Here we go. See you then. See you. See you then.